how does the Orthodox view post-schism saints? So um, you're asking how do the does the Orthodox Church view them and not me, but I'll answer both of those. Um, so the Orthodox Church views them with no particular, like we don't have make any particular judgment on them. Uh, we don't celebrate them because they weren't in communion with us. So if you're not in communion with us, um, it doesn't really make sense to venerate you as a saint because to be a saint means you are part of the communion of saints and you're in communion with us. You know, that isn't to say that there aren't there weren't saintly people who in the West, for example, after the schism, who um, are right now reigning alongside Christ. I have no doubt that there are many, many, many of those people, but we don't make a particular judgment on it. Now, in the event of a possible reunion with Rome, um, I think the question will have to be raised whether or not we can um, venerate certain um, Western saints. Now, I... I'm no, I have no particular, so now to give my take on it, I don't have too many particular thoughts on it. Now, I, I, I definitely think that there are many people who are considered saints by Roman Catholics who definitely deserve that title. Um, and, but there are also people who I'm like quite skeptical of. I'm very skeptical, for, for example, of the stigmata. Um, and now St. Francis of Assisi, Looking at his life, I don't see anything that would make me think he was some sort of crazy delusional heretic. Uh, Ticon Pino has a really good essay entitled, I believe it's called St. Francis of Assisi as a Hesychast. Um, and I think it's very interesting. But um, I'm skeptical of the stigmata and the fact that it literally only arises like decades after the schism is quite suspicious to me. So I would have to, you know, defer my mind my mind to the church on this matter because i really don't know um again looking at his life he looks his, his life looks saintly um but at the same time i'm skeptical of the stigmata and then there's someone like um uh joseph cunt something um <laughs> that's the only part i remember of his name it's k-u-n-t something he was this um man who basically oppressed and murdered orthodox christians um, um, trying to force them to become unions in Ukraine, I believe. And I definitely would never ve venerate him, and I would have a big issue with being in communion with people who venerate a man like that. Now, from what I've heard, there is there was never really local veneration of this man. Um, so um, it was more of like a top-down imposed thing. That's what I've heard. So um, yeah, so the question of post schism saints, I really don't think we can answer it now. I think we would have to look at the event of a true reunion in truth, of course, um, we can never compromise our faith. And the church would really, I think, basically have to sift through Western saints. And we, we would have to figure out alongside the Roman Catholics who we can accept and not. Um, but I do, I tend to think that we could accept a large majority of Western saints as saintly people. Um, and and I, I don't know if a reunion would even be possible if we we're going to have to force the entire western all the western churches to reject devotion to all of these people who they've been um who, who they've been venerating for so long um now again this is just my personal opinion i don't speak for the church um i said that earlier so if you just joined i'm speaking my personal opinion i definitely think there are saints um who existed in the west after the schism um, the Orthodox Church doesn't officially recognize them as saints because they weren't in communion with us, and to be a saint means to be part of the communion of saints um, that constitutes um, the Church in Heaven. Um, and But um, I, I think it's really a question that the Church will have to address in the event of a reunion with the West in truth. Okay, so next question. Oh, okay, well, that um, transitions really well. Um, if the Roman Catholic Church and Orthodoxy combined um, overnight and had a council, what would be the main points of discussion? Okay, that's that's a good question. Um, I think at this point in history, the number one question would be the papacy. Um, in the in the time of the actual schism and at the time of Florence, when they were seeing if we could um, solve the schism, the big issue was the filioque. So people sort of look back in history um, after Vatican I and II and think that the papacy was this huge issue. But the papacy was actually quite a minor issue at the time. And we should also note that 
even in the 14th century, the conciliar movement was huge in the Western church. It definitely hadn't been completely subdued as it has been now. So um, there were many, many Western... um, Many Western uh, Roman Catholics who are in schism with the East technically, um, usually they were outside of Italy, um, and they didn't have the high, really high view of of the Pope that you see at dogmatized at Vatican I. So the papacy wasn't the biggest issue at all in um, in the in at Florence, for example. A bigger issue was whether or not we should. Um, there should be um, enzymes in the communion bread. So that was a bigger issue, whether or not um, we should use wafers or um, rising bread. Um, that was a bigger issue than the papacy. They spent more time on that. But the number one issue was always, it's always been the filioque. Um, and the filioque, the filioque, I think, as it was dogmatized at Florence, simply needs to be discarded. Um, it was based on many mistranslations um, and sometimes outright forgeries of Western and Eastern fathers. Um, and that this can be verified by um, Thomas Aquinas's um, treatise against the Greeks. Um, and I think this actually speaks in favor of Thomas because I didn't think he knew there are forgeries. But, um, and, and if he truly believed they weren't forgeries, it kind of makes sense he ha- held the positions he did because if you read it, you're like, whoa, overwhelming consensus of, of, of the fathers disagree with the Orthodox um, positions on the matters of, of, of faith that they disagree with Catholics on, but most of the quotes from the fathers in Thomas's book are forgeries. So you kind of need to look at the history there and see just how bad the forgeries were at this time, especially in the West unfortunately, and those forgeries led to the schism, basically. Um, They were which really gave the ammo to the Western bishops to call us heretics. Keep in mind that the the Western, the Latins at this time, they were were less ecumenical than us. They they were calling us heretics. They were trying to kick us out of the church. Um, Now, um, actually, uh, Jeremiah, in, in the prophet Jeremiah, talks about the lying scribes, the hand of the lying scribes who are deceiving Israel. I think we see that happen again in, in church history with the schism. I think that, not to say that the East was, the East was completely free from, um, was completely free from forgeries, but even, um, um, even, uh, um, the Roman Catholic Church now will acknowledge that they're forgeries. So um, the donation of Constantine is one example. I don't think that's not on the filioque, that's on the papacy, but still. So yeah, the biggest issue right now, I think, would be the papacy because we live in a post-Vatican I world. And simply put, the, the structure, the ecclesial structure of the Vatican I church is not compatible with orthodoxy. This is obvious. Um, and the filioque is the main um, dogmatic issue here. Um, I think issues of the divine simplicity, this would be one. Um, I disagree with um, certain people in the Orthodox community, community who make it bigger than it is, just because, not that I don't think polemism isn't dogmatic in the church, just that I'm not convinced that the Roman Catholic Church is as strictly Thomist as people think, especially after Vatican II. Uh, people like to um, accuse Vatican II of all these terrible things. And it might, it's definitely true that Vatican II um, uh, supported some things we wouldn't like to. Um, and I can see why traditional uh, Roman Catholics wouldn't like it. But I think Orthodox people should rejoice over Vatican II. Vatican II opened the Catholic Church up to us. Um, it be, they became much more ecumenical. Um, and that's good for us. It's good for other people to be very ecumenical um, because then they will talk to us. Um, and also they they definitely move towards more orthodox views on the Holy Spirit, on the nature of the church. Um, not to say they went far enough, but um, on Thomism. Vatican II is where Thomism as the dogmatic um, structure of Catholic theology was basically overturned. That's why you have so many traditional Catholics who have such a big issue with it, but this is good for us because there are many essential elements of Thomism that we can't affirm. So um, I just don't necessarily see Roman Catholic theology as this hegemonic thing that is just Thomism because most I would go so far as to say most Roman Catholics don't hold to the strict scholastic Thomism of like the late 19th century. Um, they are much more open-minded on this. Just reads like the Communio people. Read David Schindler. He's super Orthodox. He's awesome. And he's Roman Catholic. So um, I don't necessarily think that... Um, um, I, I, I don't 
I don't know, like I can't predict the future, but I don't know if the issue of the essence energy distinction, all this would be as big as, for example, the papacy, because really Thomism is not dogmatic in the, in the Catholic church, at least not anymore. Um, so you can point to that and say, oh, there's a consistency because this papal bull said this Thomistic doctrine is doc, uh, this Thomistic idea is doctrine. And then we have Vatican II overturns this. It's like, okay, yeah, you can point out that that is a contradiction and why you should become Orthodox because of that. Fair enough. But at the same time, you should also accept that the Roman Catholic mind has opened up to um, to orthodoxy, and it's largely because of the good uh, orthodox ecumenism of the early 20th century. It sort of went off the rails later in, in the century, in, in the last century. But like Florovsky, who um, there's something really inspiring about Florovsky's ecumenism, where he goes out to the World Council of Churches and he says that. Um, it, while we have all these Protestants uh, talking about, oh, we are, we're, we're trying to recover a unity we already have, but we just need to make it manifest. And then Florovsky goes out there and says, no, <laughs> we are the one true church. And yes, we will dialogue with you, but we're here to bring you home. Um, he wasn't as you know explicit at that. He, he was more um, charitable, I guess. But Still, um, the the shift in the Roman Catholic mind in the 20th century century was largely due to Orthodox ecumenism, and that is just a historical fact. So whether you like it or not, it is um, it is a fact. Tell us Bound has partnered with Orthodox Depot, the premier marketplace for Orthodox Christian goods, boasting an extensive selection of high quality and affordable handcrafted crosses, prayer ropes, icons, books, and even apparel. Orthodox Depot is dedicated to aiding Orthodox communities worldwide. Notably, they successfully raised funds for the restoration of the Holy Trinity Monastery in Serbia. Use the referral link in the description to support the channel.